what we will do today we will execute the random number programs and the simpson's rule programs and then start introduction to scilab so in the last class we did a matrix inversion and we use the matrix inversion to compute the coefficients of a polynomial fit and there we use the matrix inversion as a subroutine so in this lecture also we will have the use of several subroutines and it will also acquaint you with a further use of subroutines in particular in a subroutine the dimensions have to be variable because one main program may have one dimension and another main program may have a different dimension and you want to link the same subroutine to different programs so different main programs will have, will have different dimensions so the subroutine should be flexible enough to adjust to different dimensions so that is what i will show in the simpson's rule program first we will consider the random number program so i will move to the random number directory okay so i have moved to the random number directory this is r a n n u m so i will list all the files okay so there are these several programs here gauss.f that is a gaussian random number program and ran1.f that is a uniform random number program so let us just first execute the uniform random number program so i will edit that program vi uh, r a n 1.f okay so this is my uh, random number program let us look through the lines again so first line is the program random number then dimension distribution 101 so what i want to do i want to generate uh, lots of random numbers between 0 and 1 and then see how they are distributed between 0 and 1 okay so this random number program <coughs> has to have an initial seed i dumb uh, remember in my earlier class i told you that this variable should be other than 0 so this is some starting seed i dumb then this particular array distribution 101 i will set all those values to 0 so this particular loop do 50 i going from 1 to 101 50 distribution i 0 so all the initial values are set to 0 so then what i do i will generate <coughs> now random numbers do 100 i going from 1 to 10000 so 100 is this loop so do 100 means it will do all these lines up to 10000 so i want to generate 10000 random numbers so each time to get a random number <coughs> to get a random number a equal to ran 0 i dum this is my function ran 0 is my function okay so each time i call this function it gives me a random number so if i want i can write all those random numbers in some file unit 11 but right now i am not interested in writing because i have verified that they are all between 0 and 1 you can verify that yourself now once i have a random number between 0 and 1 i want to decide at what region between 0 and 1 it lies so what i do i create an integer so this integer is a divided by 0.01 so i know that between 0 and 1 i will make 100 bins and when i divide by 0.01 the number i get will be between 0 and 100 for example suppose a is 0.5 if a is 0.5 when i divide by 0.01 i will get 50 so that 0.5 will lie in that 50th box similarly suppose a is exactly 1 so if a is exactly 1 which is unlikely so 1 by 0.01 is 100 so i will add 1 so that random number will 1 will go in that 101st box if the random number is 0 so 0 by 0.01 is 0 so that will go in the first box the reason i am adding 1 i don't want this integer m to be 0 because if it is 0 i will have a problem of that uh, accessing that particular variable because usually all my variables will go from 1 2 3 up to 101 so in old compilers any variable with zero as the uh, array variable will not work so all my arrays will start from 1 to 101 all my uh, values will distribution 1 distribution 2 they will all go between 1 and 101 therefore i am adding this one so once i know where that random number lies 
So, that particular box now this is really like a box. So, in so when I generate these 10,000 random numbers each one will be between 0 and 1. So, they will all be distributed and put in these boxes like it is a histogram. So, that histogram will be updated. So, the total number of random numbers is 10,000. So, I expect that the, all the random numbers will be distributed and if they are uniformly distributed each one of these distribution should be uh, since there are 100, 100 bins. So, each one should give me about 100 because 100 into 100 is 10,000. So, I call the random number through this function okay, and it gets distributed and I will write all the distribution and random numbers in this file 11. I will write all that in file 11 and then I have given a format also. I have given a format so that in each line this is my format. Okay. So, uh, so, I will write in file 11, okay, I will write this star means no format whereas, I want to also write on the screen. See this is okay. it writes there is two write statements here one uh, distribution of random numbers. Okay. So, let us execute. So, there are two write statements. Okay. So, okay. first write statement it just writes the distribution of random numbers. This is it writes whatever in this quotes. Okay first quote and second quote it writes in that file distribution of random numbers. The second write writes me all the variables. Okay. So, I shall execute it, I shall execute this program. So, let me come out. So, I shall compile this. ran 1 dot f. So, now dot slash a dot o u t. So, this has executed. So, now let us see where all the data is. So, since I had not opened any file with uh, unit 11, it creates now a file called fort dot 11. When you do not say anything, the Fortran compiler itself creates this file fort dot 11 because 11 there was nothing in the program for unit 11. So, let us edit 4.11. So, now you will see that the first statement was the distribution of random numbers between 0 and 1. So, now it is writing it is writing those 101 values of the distribution. So, you will see that. So, the last one is 0. So, that means there is no random number which was exactly 1. Okay, this is the 101st point in that variable distr. Now, if you see from beginning, so these are all, so 92 is the number of random numbers between 0 and 0 0.01, 115 is the number of random numbers between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02. So, you will see that most of these boxes, most of these random numbers in this region, they are all between around uh, 80 to uh, <coughs> 80 to about the maximum value is let us see which is the maximum value 106, 110. Okay. So, the maximum value is around 123 and the lowest value will be somewhere around 87 or there could be some smaller value. So, which means these random numbers are more or less uniformly distributed. If it is a perfect random number system every box should contain 100 random numbers, but no random number is going to be completely perfect. So, you will see that these random numbers are distributed between uh, 0 and 1 fairly uniformly. Lowest value is in the 80s, 82, highest value around 120 odd. So, they are all uniformly distributed. So, that means this random number generator is a fairly good random number generator. So, I would urge you that remember I said I took this from numerical recipes, one of the first algorithms. There are many other random number programs in that book. I would urge you to try some different random number generator and execute the same program. So, next I will go to a Simpson's rule subroutine. Okay, I shall go to another directory now. So, I shall go back to my original directory. So, you will see in my main directory program directory there are many many uh, sub directories. So, I went to the random number sub directory and executed. Now, I will go to the integral sub directory. Okay. 
So, in this directory there are two files one is simp.f and one is a.out. So, okay, let us edit the simp.f. So, what we have done in this particular program? So, this is a program for Simpson's rule integration and I am using two functions for the Simpson's rule integration. Remember the normal Simpson's rule program is for odd number of points. So, therefore, this B201 uh, I will generate the entire function values uh, in this particular array okay? and I will also have a array with even number of points because I want to show how to use the Simpson's rule both for even number of points and odd number of data points. Okay? So, first I shall generate my data points. Okay? So, one is n e 1 equal to 200, n odd equal to 201. For both these functions I will use a spacing of 0 0.005 because I have 200 points 0, 0 0.005 into 200 is 1. So, I want to generate uh, two functions in these arrays. So, for the even array I am going to use exponential function. See there is a 200 I will use an exponential function for my even array and for an odd array I will use a sine function. Okay? I will use a sine function for the odd array. Okay? So, for the odd array there was an extra extra point 200 and first point. So, I generate that b n odd is equal to sine of space star n odd. The spacing is 0 0.005 for both, uh, both variables and so I have generate an exponential function and put that in array A and I have put a sine function and put in array B. Both of them are generated for 200 points and since the sine function has an extra, uh, extra dimension that is it has 201. So, I have generated that last point for the B array. Okay? So, now I am going to call the Simpson's rule twice, one for the odd number of points. See this is call simp b comma n odd comma space comma w. So, this call statement has four variables, b is my array variable, n odd is the number of data points in that particular array, spacing is the spacing in the integration uh, process and w is the value of the integral. So, once it calls this subroutine, uh, it has got my answer. So, I will write on the screen, write the value of the integral, first integral and 1 minus cos x. Okay? So, this is the value of the integral. So, I want to compare the numerical value of the integral with the analytical value of the integral. Okay? So, I am writing the value of the integral as well as the analytical value of the integral. So, once this is done, in the next call statement, I am using the same subroutine and now I am calling. So, next time call simp a n e 1 space w. So, in the earlier case I have called an odd number of data points. In the second case the array is different now. See in the second case array is a, the number of points is n e 1 space and w. These are the same. So, what this illustrates I can use the same subroutine with a different number of dimensions of that array. Okay? And Second one is an exponential, so it will write uh, the integral, the value of the integral, both the numerical value and the analytical value, stop and end. So, now let us briefly see how that subroutine works. In that subroutine, remember we have already studied the Simpson's rule program. So, if the number of data is odd, I will keep on uh, multiplying alternate values with 4 and 2. Remember? The way I will uh, do the Simpson's integration, each time 4 times one value of the array and 2 times the other value of the array. Okay? So, I would urge you to look at this in great detail. So, this is for, uh, this is both for even and odd number of points. Now, let us see if n by 2 star 2 equal to n. Okay? So, that means n is an integer. If integer by 2, suppose this is an even integer, say it is 100. 100 by 2 will be 50, 50 into 2 will be 100. So, 100 equal to 100, then that is an even number, it will go to 100. But suppose n is an odd number. Okay? So, this is an integer division. If n is 1, 1 by 2. So, 1 by 2 is 0.5 in your real arithmetic. 
but in integer arithmetic there is no such thing as 1 by 2. So, this will be 0. So, 1 by 2 will be 0 if it is an integer, but 2 by 2 will be 1. So, anything other than a whole number this will be 0 that is an integer division. So, whenever n is odd, so n by 2 into 2 will not be equal to n. So, whenever this is odd number it will do the first loop here and whenever it is an even number it goes to 100 and it will do the calculation for the even number. So, what I do for the even number is that the last two points, last two points I will integrate using a trapezoidal rule and the first n minus 1 which is odd they will do exactly as I did for the Simpson's rule with the odd uh, number of points. So, this particular uh, subroutine illustrates that the variable a a could have dimensions of n when it is an even number it will go to 100 and do the calculation, when it is an odd number it will do the calculations here and this illustrates that the array variables in a subroutine can be variable and this is very important because you do not know which main program will have how many points for that integration. So, this illustrates how to give a variable number of dimensions in the subroutine. So, I have done it using uh, all the things that are in the subroutine are given in that subroutine statements a a n space w and the array a a has been assigned dimension n and this n is a variable it takes whatever values it gets from the main program. So, I have now this particular uh, subroutine uh, simp, simp. So, I shall execute it. simp dot f. Okay. So, the results are already given here when I execute the first integral was a sine function. So, when I integrate 0.4638 is the value of the integral done by the Simpson subroutine and 0.4639 is the value of the integral using the analytical integration. Similarly, for the exponential function the value of the integral is 1.737132 using my subroutine and it is 1.718 using the analytic function. So, you will see that these are fairly accurate, these are fairly accurate here the accuracy is only up to the third decimal place, but if I want much greater accuracy I shall uh, the way I should do it is to use double precision. I will just illustrate uh, how to do that. So, what I do if I want higher accuracy, okay, so what I will do So, I have declared all the variables in the sub pro in the main program to be double precision and so I should do that exactly in the subroutine also. Okay. So, this implicit what it does is it makes all variables which are starting with a and h and o and z to be uh, double precision variables. So, let us see I, I will compile again. So, we see that first thing that we see is that the integration has been done up to a very large number of digits. So, 4, 3, 4, 6, 3, 8, 9, 4, 6, 3, 9. So, the accuracy did not change very much this is in the fourth decimal place. So, second one 1.7132, 1.718 although accuracy did not change 
uh, as far as the numbers are concerned still uh, the precision is much higher in a real star 8 calculation. So, we did both a double precision calculation as well as single precision calculation. So, what I will do I will uh, conclude my demonstration part here and now I shall start using Scilab. Okay. So, we shall now switch over to a new software called Scilab and the later part of the lecture will be using the Scilab. So, we will continue now with our discussion on Scilab as I mentioned several times. So, this is a free software which can be downloaded on your windows operating system as well as a, on a Linux operating system. So, how to download on a Linux operating system you can see on a YouTube on my present computer I have downloaded it on my windows operating system. So, see the command to download it. So, it is a Scilab is a freely downloadable software you can use the link http colon slash slash www dot scilab dot org. So, download this on your computer and install this. Okay. Once to install this and run the Scilab environment what you get is shown on this blue screen here. You will have a top line some Scilab version this is a 5.2.2 it will give all these uh, copyright commands and it loading the initial environment this particular arrow slash dash dash arrow this is the Scilab environment. Once you have this particular arrow that means you are ready to execute all the commands in Scilab. So, we will illustrate a few very simple commands now and then continue with all the more advanced commands. Okay. So, one good thing about Scilab is you can get help for any command. Okay. Suppose you want some command on a matrix operation. Okay. So, you will just say help that command name it will give you full detail of how that command works. Okay. So, now let us start some very simple operations in Scilab. Suppose you want to do calculations A equals to B equals to and A plus B. So, you just type A equal to 2 enter B equal to 2 enter A plus B it will give the output as A plus B. Okay. So, this is just an addition operation in a Scilab. Okay. Then let us see some other operation suppose I want to multiplication operations A equals 2, B equals 3, C equals 8. So, to separate two different lines in Fortran I have to write all these three in different lines. So, a semicolon separates two particular commands. So, A equal to 2 was one command semicolon B equal to 3 separate command semicolon C equal to 8 separate command semicolon enter. So, then once you enter a star B star C now it just gives the answer as 48. So, this is how the commands are separated and executed. Now, Scilab has different forms of do loops. So, now suppose I want to sum numbers from 1 to 10. The way I did it in uh, Fortran I have to start a do loop then initiate the do loop then end the do loop then sum all the variables. Here it is very very simple sum into bracket 1 colon 10 bracket complete that means it will sum all the numbers between 1 and 10. So, answer is 55 the same way as I sum 1 to 10 I can also take products into bracket prod into bracket 1 colon 10 that means it will take all the numbers between 1 and 10 and multiply them and this is my answer. Okay. So, that is a product of uh, n numbers. So, now just as Fortran has different kinds of functions Scilab also has different functions. For example, suppose I want square root of 456. So, it has a square root function into bracket 456 you do that then this is the answer. So, what it means is that once you get this arrow once you get this arrow you are in an executable environment of the Scilab and everything is a command there. Okay. So, in Fortran when you typed a dot out the commands were executed. So, that means this arrow is in an executable environment everything that you give here is a command, but suppose I want a comment statement a comment statement can also be given in Scilab and that comment statement uh, is given below, but so let before I go to that. So, square root 456 it gave me the answer now suppose x is equal to sin 30. 
So, when it gave sin 30, so it gave this value minus point minus 0 0.9880316 and this value is in radians. So, comment lines in Scilab are with this double slash. When I give a double slash that means whatever is written on the right hand side it is not executed, it is a comment. Okay. So, this says that this sin 30 that is executed in radians. Okay. So, now what I want to do Scilab has certain uh, predefined constants. Okay. So, I will give a list of these constants and conclude this lecture. So, percentage i is an imaginary number, imaginary number you know that uh, you, are, you have real numbers and complex numbers. So, percentage i would mean it is x plus i y. So, this is an imaginary number, uh, percentage e means that is an Euler constant 2.7182828. So, what I will do? Uh, I will stop this lecture here and in the next one I will conclude, I will start with the same particular slide. Thank you.